Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Directions Mag geospatial webinar. I'm Barbara Duke, Managing Editor here at Directions Magazine with our Assistant Webinar Producer, Lynette Qualia. Thank you to our loyal geospatial community supporting our magazine. We appreciate you reading our articles, daily news, and of course, watching all those great webinars at directionsmag.com. We have a very talented team with us today. We're excited to have Dr. Lorraine Tai back with us. She has brought along with her Adam Martin, Dr. Oren Aiden, and Hong Zhu. They are going to talk to us about scientific analysis today and have some amazing tools to share um, that you can get started with quite easily. So Lorraine, I'll pass it over to you to uh, get us started. Welcome. Thank you so much here today. We are so excited to spend some time with you to talk about open scientific analysis. Uh, my colleagues and I will introduce how the ArcGIS ecosystem supports open scientific analysis to help us better understand Earth system processes using a fully web-enabled GIS. As Barbary said, please do drop your questions and comments in the chat at any time throughout the presentation. We have ensured to save ample time at the end to address your questions. And we will take the opportunity to engage with you with three polls today to get a little more insight into what your interest is in this field. Note that all the examples and use cases that we will be discussing today will be supplied as resources in a follow-up email and this will help you to further understand open scientific analysis. My name is Lorraine. I am the Director of Earth Sciences Solutions here at ESRI, and I focus on geospatial technology for Earth Sciences applications. I'm also joined today by Adam Martin, who is a product manager focused on ArcGIS system interoperability and integration patterns and international standard support. We also have Hong, who is a principal software um, product engineer on the imagery and remote sensing team. And she is leading the multidimensional raster development project. And we have Dr. Oren Aiden, a senior researcher on the spatial statistic and science teams. He has extensive background on Earth system applications and scientific analysis. Our agenda includes some brief presentations and demonstrations on the tools, workflows, and resources that have been developed by ESRI to support open scientific analysis. Today, we will explore a fully analytical ecosystem for extensible and reproducible research. We'll show you how to easily integrate and work with tools and languages such as Python, R, and Jupyter Notebooks. You get to see how to create historical trends, see change, make predictions, and work with the whole time series set of Earth observation data sets. We will also share the links to these notebooks so that you can build these scientific methods and models on your own. Um, after a few more slides, we'll then move into Adam, who will shed some light into an open ecosystem and why that matters. And then we'll move into the technical portion of the agenda led by Han and Dr. Aiden. For more than half a century, Earth observation data has been presenting a synoptic view of our planet, whether observing a region, a state, a county, or the globe. Such a view is critical for understanding Earth systems. In recent years, sorry, in recent years, scientists, analysts, and conservationists have had massive volumes of Earth observation data at their fingertips for applying scientific research. These digital slices of daily, weekly, monthly temperatures, global wind patterns, weather patterns, land cover maps, snow cover information, and so on. These data layer by layer build up a digital twin of the Earth. An ArcGIS technology provides a connective thread or spatial context to these layers and a geospatial framework to allow for model, modeling, and to create the what-if scenarios to help us understand the complex challenges facing Earth and its response to um, you know, biodiversity loss, ecosystem degradation, 
a decline in re, uh, natural resources, and a very hot topic of climate change. ArcGIS is an open science ecosystem rooted in location intelligence or where, the science of where, and it is helping scientists use cutting edge research tools to conduct open and repeat, repeatable analysis. We'll then turn it over to Adam. Every, hi everybody, I'm gonna provide a quick overview of what ArcGIS is at a high level, what it means for ArcGIS to be an open platform, and why we think that matters. And then I'm gonna hand it off to the real data scientists here on the call to show you some of these examples in action. So it's good to think about, as Lorraine said, about ArcGIS as a rich digital ecosystem that powers the science of where. And that means providing geospatial infrastructure and tooling that is needed to provide uh, to support end-to-end -end workflows for Earth observation analysis, from data management to analysis to collaboration and sharing. And our goal uh, through ArcGIS is to provide powerful and reusable tools that work in a variety of deployment contexts so that you and your organizations can really focus more of your time and resources on the stuff that only you can do, the critical thinking and analysis that we need to advance uh, the science of our planet. Um, but while also allowing you to maintain control that you may want or need to manage data security or intellectual property as desired. First, uh, I want to highlight within this ecosystem, a few relevant products and tools that, that were mentioned and, and that you'll see in demos. First, ArcGIS Image is a end-to-end -end imagery management system that provides uh, analysis-ready imagery data and is uh, designed to sit within the, your cloud of choice next to your data and engineered to provide distributed and scalable processing that really bring image workflow times down from days to even hours and, and even seconds. And it's important to know that ArcGIS dynamic image services are, are Esri's data model to simultaneously allow you to explore and, and analyze all different kinds of imagery data with a built-in catalog similar to Stack and built-in raster functions that enable server-side processing on the fly in just the, your areas of interest, which really speed up exploration and analysis. This cloud infrastructure is also being offered in a managed service and a SaaS model in addition to the traditional software model uh, through ArcGIS Enterprise. ArcGIS Pro, which you may be familiar with, is, according to our poll, is a power, our powerful desktop analysis workstation. And uh, of note, it includes this robust Python distribution managed by the Conda framework. The rich ArcGIS geoprocessing framework includes over 2,000 geoprocessing and machine learning tools for raster and vector analysis and is available uh, through our applications and directly through Python classes in our, in our Python libraries. And this Python library, as well as your own custom Python scripts, can be embedded in ArcGIS notebooks, our Python notebook offering, which are built locally into Pro or, and hosted in ArcGIS Online and deployable in the cloud of your choice, or you can use your own notebook environment and just call our IPI for Python, which is well-documented and downloadable and open for inspection. Now, improving the science of where has really been core to Esri's mission for, for over 50 years. And as ArcGIS has evolved and this ecosystem has evolved, we continue to be dedicated to lowering the barrier of entry to scientific research production and reproduction. And to do that, we have to design a fundamentally open system. And now that open means different things to different people. Uh, and for now, I'm just gonna focus on three of these dimensions that, that matter. And we're gonna touch on some of the others in later in the discussion and demos. First, open standards. Standards, of course, are, are crucial to lowering the cost of exchanging data and in many use cases. And, so we support interoperability through international standards developed through ISO and, and the Open Geospatial Consortium, OGC, which is having its meeting right now. Uh, and an ArcGIS image, for example, supplies uh, WMS and WCS services and WMTS services out of the box alongside Esri's dynamic image services. We're a leading vendor in OGC compliance um, and participate in the development st of, of standards themselves, serving on OGC leadership and as a representative 
in the US ISO Committee for Geospatial Standards internationally. On the open source front, Esri incorporates open source libraries and tools into our products and contributes back to their development um, through, through time of employees and funding of key projects that really help the entire geospatial and scientific community. For example, with GDAL, we're a, a maintainer of the WMS driver and contribute financially. And, and that means you can use, let's say, our Esri Mars terrain base map uh, in planetariums and other third party applications. Um, and this year, we also extended support of, of Esri feature services and other web services in open source clients like Open Layers and Leaflet and the open source version of, of MapX JLJS. Um, the last aspect I'll mention now is the open architecture, the fact that ArcGIS infrastructure and tools can be deployed and scaled within your organization's cloud infrastructure of choice, whether it's public, private, hybrid, you know, AWS, Azure coming soon, Google Cloud, or through OpenShift. And that means uh, also deploying enterprise and servers uh, and per virtualized pro instances within Microsoft and Linux operating systems, or uh, calling you know, Python libraries within your own uh, integrated development environment. Uh, and even deploying spatial analytical libraries in your own Spark clusters. Um, this year, we're also rolling out ArcGIS Enterprise for Kubernetes, which is the open source container orchestration system for organizations with uh, very mature IT groups and systems. And lastly, uh, we, we're also increasing our integrated support for cloud data warehouses like Google BigQuery and Snowflake to take advantage of those tools and their processing power, all to um, you know, towards the goal of being integrated and interoperable. And why does that matter? I mean, ultimately these features really lower the barrier of access of sharing and ultimately are meant to save you time. Less time downloading and exchanging and transforming data. Less time configuring tools to fit into your environments. Less time training models and documenting and sharing your methods. And perhaps most crucially, less time getting those results out into the world and, and, and impactful visualizations and interactions in web maps and apps. And in saving time, that means that the science of climate and oceans and biodiversity advances faster. So we're looking forward to seeing some of these examples in action. To simplify things a little bit more, just you know, there's a lot of things in this ecosystem, a lot of tools. And I, I, let me let's just talk a little bit more in detail and break it down into three different groups. Um, ArcGIS, uh, that three different categories that ultimately support the whole cycle of scientific research shown here. So ArcGIS supports data, both curated insight-ready data services, as well as data management tools, analytical engines, and sharing tools that take those results and, and create engaging experiences. So let's walk through these in turn. First with ArcGIS data management. The ArcGIS clients uh, like Pro and Online and, and our, our Python environments allow you to natively work with diverse set of data formats and types bringing them all together as layers within our abstracted information model that allow you to quickly combine and reference these data into maps and apps, as well as analyze them through our analysis tools. And perhaps most relevant here are the variety of imagery and multidimensional data formats that we support, including raw imagery data from you know, 30 plus satellite sensors, as well as, well as just as many other sensors uh, in cameras and, and um, radar and things that are flown on drones and airplanes or even driven around, uh, dri driven around on street level. You know, we're talking about TIFFs, COGS, NetCDF, GRIB, HDF formats, all of which can be uh, used, packaged into image cubes, visualized in voxel formats and exported back as data into connected cloud stores. And if there aren't certain versions of these data formats that are natively supported, uh, sorry, if there are certain versions that aren't natively supported, we, then we have another set of tools that allow you to work with virtually any format. And that could be using the Python API, calling uh, external libraries, or, or using uh, distributed libraries to call, let's say, raw, raw radar data uh, and, and convert it into spatial data frames and notebooks, or directly tap our GDAL conversion library using scripts and, and drivers in, in ArcGIS Pro. 
or converting from hundreds of formats, GML, et cetera, using our no-code interface for the data interoperability extension um, powered by FME, and uh, or leveraging uh, one of our open source projects like Coop, which is a Node.js server with a plug-in architecture that allows you to bridge practically any API or into GeoJSON and then ArcGIS feature service format. All tools to help you put your data to work. But before you go, you know, baking your own data and, and working with that, it's worth exploring our Esri's vast collection of ready-to-use data services. Um, now, these data services, apps, and models are provided through the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the world. And this is an ever-evolving collection uh, that includes premium content uh, that, that's paid for and managed and curated through it by Esri, as well as open data. Um, and many of the most widely used Earth observation data sets like Landsat and MODIS and GLDS or even land cover data from ESSA's Climate Change Initiative are curated and made available here, as well as um, data that's provided by other ArcGIS users like NOAA and NASA and USGS. Now, on the analytics front, as we mentioned earlier, all your data can be explored and analyzed using a rich set of, of analytical tools like time series forecasting, Bayesian creaking, spatially constrained multivariate clustering, and hundreds of other geoprocessing tools for standard and vector for standard vector and tabular analysis, as well as purpose-built tools tailored to analysis of elevation models or road networks and real-time data streams, and as well as over 100 raster processing functions, many of which are built directly into our image service model for processing on the fly, and, and but are also available in our clients, both through point-and-click wizard types of interfaces, uh, as well as directly accessible in our Python modules to create new imagery products. And if uh, even though our, uh, and for, sorry, for all our licensed geoprocessing tools, we, we strive to create first class documentation of the algorithms and, and methodologies that are used behind those tools in our implementation of them. For example, with this continuous land cover detection uh, land cover change detection and classification tool that we're scrolling through on the screen. It describes in detail how the tool works and the underlying academic basis for that implementation in ArcGIS Pro. Just a click away from the tool itself. And while uh, the ArcGIS geoprocessing tools are always evolving to improve on performance and ease of use, you can still use your own tools or, or frameworks of choice and, and take still take advantage of the other data hosting and, and app sharing aspects of the ArcGIS ecosystem. Our Python distribution managed by Conda and, and ArcGIS Pro and Notebooks includes dozens of open science libraries like MetPy and others uh, for easy session access within those uh, environments. And you can always import your other third-party libraries and use R and SAS bridges to tap other processing tools that are more tailored to your scientific domain. It's worth noting also that we have about 20 pre-trained deep learning packages that um, leverage open source algorithms and can be further trained. And several of those are like our land cover and human settlement classification packages, ship detection, are trained for use with Landsat and Sentinel data, which are provided uh, as services by Esri. Finally, ArcGIS provides a variety of sh ways to share both your original data, your analysis steps, and your scripts, results, both, in both instantly for feedback as shareable web layers and web maps, and through more sustained programmatic methods. So input data, for example, or, and your output data can be shared uh, on, and published as hosted services, both Esri and OGC web services, along with their full ISO metadata and then quickly added to web maps or exploratory apps using off-the-shelf templates. And hosted data can instantly be made available for download uh, just with the click of a bucket, but, button into multiple standard formats uh, through ArcGIS Online and Enterprise Portal, and then disseminated in more tailored experiences to, to target audiences through ArcGIS Hub or Enterprise Sites which are simple drag and drop website building tools tailored to share geospatial data and apps. And in the spirit of sharing and porting your analysis, 
Your projects in ArcGIS Pro can be easily ported to other Pro users using the project packaging tool, which includes uh, the Python notebook you, you were using, the input data, uh, so that others can rerun that analysis in their uh, in their environment. And if analysis is done in, in one of our notebooks, you can also export and share that uh, notebook um, either on the web or as an independent Python notebook that uh, others with local access to an ArcGIS user identity could use. And I think Oren's going to show us that in action. And there are other patterns to share models and analytical tools as services uh, to support um, you know, wider inference making and, and reproducibility of your analysis on the web. And I just want to highlight a couple of the do, few different products that, that I mentioned that are part of this low code and no code option for creating apps, web apps, to share your data in engaging ways and explain your process to stakeholder and funder communities. Um, you might remember dashboards um, through the actually actually the ArcGIS dashboard that John Hopkins used in in the early days and throughout COVID to monitor the, the diseases spread. That was an ArcGIS dashboard. Uh, and several of these app templates used through these products are open source templates, which means if you have extra you know resources or developers that you know you could go that extra mile, you can leverage our toolkits like Web App Builder Developer Edition or JavaScript API and some of these open source templates to build off of to create uh, you know, really engaging and dynamic experiences using your resulting data as well as your analysis tools. For, the, for example, this web app that we're looking at was built by Azure developers um, using the NASA's Global Land Data Assimilation System and uh, the NOAA Land Service Model, which estimates rain runoff and evaporation and soil uh, saturation. And uh, this allows us to really look back at all that data in a really interesting dynamic way going back to 2000 uh, after aggregating it. Thanks, Adam. And now we're going to hear from Lorraine and then see a demo from Hong. Um, what we're going to see is um, a, demonst a technical demonstration using open and extensible ArcGIS notebooks and ArcPy to monitor snow cover using time series um, data set and um, covering it 21 years or so. Thanks. So you've seen the overall picture of ArcGIS system. Now I'm going to use MODIS imagery as an example to demonstrate how you can work with Earth observation data and perform time series analysis in ArcGIS. We know snow cover is a critical component of the climate system. Warmer temperature may cause uh, decreases in snow cover, and the changes in snow cover will affect the ecosystem and the access to water resources. So monitoring snow cover will provide the valuable information to planners, decision makers, to make wise decisions for a planet. In this demo, we'll use MODIS snow cover products from National Snow and Ice Data Center at NASA it is uh, monthly snow cover data from 2000 to 2020, total 21 years of data. We'll map the overall snow cover frequency, calculate seasonal frequencies, analyze the trend, and predict future snow cover. What you see here is ArcGIS notebooks. It's basically a Jupyter notebooks embedded in ArcGIS Pro for geospatial analysis using Python. Here I import ArcPy library and also import image analysis module that contains functions that are used in the demo. Before we perform analysis, we need to do some pre-processing because uh, MODIS data are stored as separate HDF files, one file per month. So we build a multi-dimensional RAS model to bring data from all those files together and use a RAS function to mask out cloud and water and uh, create an image cube. Save the data as a cloud RAS format, which is an optimized format for RAS analysis because it can store a transpose, which is very efficient for time series analysis. And here I open the cube as a multi-dimensional raster, which has uh, 245 slices we use subset function to get the first slice and the display with the color map. 
So now we are ready for analysis. And first, we'll look at the snow cover frequency in 21 years. The process is as simple as just calling an aggregate function. It calculates the mean out of all slices in the cube. And then we classify the result into eight classes and display it with a color map. Areas in dark blue, such as Greenland and Arctic, are covered with snow most of the time in the 21 years. Areas in light blue have less or no snow at all. So you can see snow occurs more frequently above 45 degrees latitude, but below 45 degrees, only the tall mountains like Himalayas or the Rocky Mountains in Western North American experienced frequent snow coverage. Second, we'll look at um, seasonal frequency. Calculate the, the mean frequency for each season out of the 21 years. We use same tool, but with a recurring quarterly keyword for the aggregation interval, and the render spring frequency data with same color wrap. To compare the four seasons, we can leverage pros visualization capability. And uh, here we linked four scenes and uh, drip the results on top of elevation data, which is an elevation service from ArcGIS Online. So what displayed here is uh, snow cover frequency in Himalaya mountains in winter, spring, autumn, and summer. So you can see seasonal variations clearly here. Snow is more frequent in winter and autumn, less frequent in spring, and the least in summer. Zoom to North America. Let's wait a second for rendering full resolution. OK, now you can see frequent snow in the Rocky Mountains in winter, and autumn, and some in spring. This area is Southern California. It has a rather hot weather, but we see snow in the nearby Big Bear Mountains, where some of my coworkers will go ski in winter and early springtime. Zoom to South America, because it's the other side of the globe. So you see more snow in, in summer and spring, less in winter. So this is the seasonal snow cover analysis. Let's move on to the third analysis. We will analyze annual snow cover trend to answer typical questions such as, did the total snow cover area decrease or increase in the past 21 years? And which areas increased and which area decreased? First, to calculate the annual snow cover area, we first aggregate data into yearly. And this time, we save the data as a NetDF file, which we'll use later. And we use a RAS function to extract pixels with frequency above zero and compute the total number of snow cover pixels for each year. And then create this annual snow cover area from 2000 to 2020 we can see that it does have a decreased trend. To map the trend at each location, we use Generate Trend Raster tool to model the trend for each pixel across time. Now here we use a linear regression model. We extract the slope band from the result and created this trend map, where area in purple has a positive slope, meaning snow cover has an increased trend, and the green has a negative slope, meaning a decreased trend. You can see that the snow cover decreases in Alaska, Siberia mountains, and some other areas. This result is consistent with the scientific findings. Next, we can predict future snow cover data. Assuming snow cover will follow the model that we have just calculated. Here we use predict function, and the input is the trend model we've just created earlier, and the specified data to predict. 
and created this snow cover frequency map for year 2025. Remember, we had saved a NCDF file from the aggregated result. Saving NCDF is a feature that we have just added recently to support data interoperability. And here, we will use this file to visualize using voxel layer. This is the yearly snow cover in Alaska. It is a voxel layer in scene view. And it's a portion of the data that we saved. Blue means snow is more frequent, and pink means less frequent. You can see that snow cover is very dynamic from year to year in this area. I can use horizontal slices to visualize the temporal change. You see frequent snow in early years because a lot of blue pixels, but less frequent as it's close to recent years. And I can visualize the vertical slices and explore the inside of the cube. And I can also filter data. For example, filter with frequency above 80. And this is the space and time that has frequent snow in the 21 years. So voxel layer gives you more insight into the data. Lastly, I can share my analysis results to my organization portal or ArcGIS Online. Here I had signed in my portal. The web user experience allows me to publish my data easily. I create an image layer, choose type imagery layer. You can create from RAS datasets, satellite imagery, NetCDF, HDF, GRIP, either a collection of files or a single data set. I'll use one image option for my trend analysis result. Drag the whole folder in. While it is preparing the data, I can define the metadata for my layer. Give a name, set the text, and go ahead to create. It has finished 40% while I'm typing. This is the one that I had published earlier, the annual snow cover trend. And you can share the item with your coworkers or anyone that you want. So that was the whole workflow of processing and analyzing Earth observation data using notebooks and the share your analysis results. In addition, I'd like to mention that you can use ArcGIS Enterprise if you need a distributed computing capability for your large data sets. This notebook is created using ArcGIS API for Python, which performs similar workflow by leveraging the image server of your enterprise. I had published the image cube as an image service. Here we include the GIS module, RAS module, include the functions for on-the-fly processing and functions for RAS analytics, which create persisted hosted imagery layers in the portal. And I connect to the portal with my credential, create multi-dimensional raster from the image service, and then perform similar analysis, create snow cover frequency map and a snow cover trend map. These are all hosted imagery layers that are accessible from the web. So this concluded my demo. Warren, over to you. Today I will talk about modeling coral bleaching and understanding the factors behind it. Warmer water temperatures can result in coral bleaching. When water, water is too form, a warm, corals will expel the algae uh, living in their tissues. And this causes what we call bleaching when the algae leaves. And this puts a lot of stress on these, uh, on these ecosystems. In addition to warmer water temperatures, other factors contribute to coral bleaching. Um, and it's important to understand what these factors are so that we can understand what the future conditions of the ocean mean for these events of coral bleaching and what they mean for corals. So today I'll be using open scientific capabilities of ArcGIS to solve this sophisticated analysis problem. In particular, I'll be using Python and R notebooks in addition to analysis that is in ArcGIS Pro to really combine ArcGIS Pro, R, 
and Python to solve this sophisticated problem. Now, let's take a look at uh, the first data set, the coral bleaching events. Coral bleaching events are measured at locations and they all come with uh, timestamps. So I'll be using what we call a data clock in ArcGIS Pro just to quickly look over some of the overall temporal patterns that we might observe about these events. You see that we have data starting in 1966 to 2012. Um, we see higher and higher measurements uh, towards the end, towards the later years. Of course, one part of this is just um, a form of sampling bias. We have um, we have a more more extensive array of measurement devices that we observe these bleaching events with, um, and we would like to understand what causes these bleaching events. Another important portion of this data set is the severity. We have high severity events, which means that a large portion of this particular coral really expel the algae, and then there are these varying um, varying different levels of um, expulsion, the, the lowest being no bleaching, meaning that there is not um, there is not bleaching observed at that location. So we know that real data never comes clean. So the first task I will take on is doing some data wrangling in Python. For this, I'll be using a Python uh, Jupyter notebook that is embedded in ArcGIS Pro. What this means that you have an R kernel running inside ArcGIS Pro that enables you to uh, run uh, Python functions. And before I go on to the details of this notebook, this is the overall workflow that I'll be performing. Um, in a minute, I will talk about some of the spatial temporal data sources that are provided by these agencies. These are openly available. What I will do is using Python, I will bring in these spatial temporal data sources from these servers. I will wrangle them. I will use some analysis functions in ArcGIS Pro to summarize, to create uh, temporal summaries similar to what Hong has done so that I can get this data uh, ready for a um, habitat analysis model, which is found in R. And at that stage, I'll be using the R ArcGIS bridge to taking this wrangled and analyzed spatiotemporal data into R as a spatial data frame and also connect R into um, the living atlas, the green icon you see here, which are curated data sources that live online that you can have access for. So with that being said, what I will do in this data set is I will remove some inconsistencies and some outliers. In order to do so, first I will need to read these coral bleaching events that we just saw into Python as a Python data frame. I will be using this ArcGIS package. This is Esri's ArcGIS API for Python. And this enables you to bring data in seamlessly. And the good news is this is an open technology that you can obtain and utilize in your workflows. So you can get this code base, you can get this Python package and use it in your spatial and spatial temporal data wrangling needs. What I will do here is I'm just going to use the Geo Accessor to directly bring in this coral bleaching feature class that lives over here. It's called coral bleaching is its name. Um, into Python as a Python data frame. And this is already a pandas type data frame. Another thing I'm going to use is this isolation forest package from scikit-learn to find some of these um, so some of these um, bleaching events that are completely isolated from the other ones in terms of the in terms of the timestamps. Meaning that if I only have very few bleaching events for an, for a year. I do not want to include this in this model as it'll bias my model towards lack of presence of bleaching in a certain year. So I'll be using the scikit-learn package. So what this means is in these notebooks, you can utilize these open source commonly used libraries alongside some of the ones that we built, such as Python API. One question you might have is, how do I install scikit-learn in Pro? Is, there, is, it, is this easy? Well, we make it as, as easy as possible for you. And if you go to Projects Python, you will see a Python package manager. This is actually a Conda package manager that you can use. If you have a function that you need, say that you need um, image learn from Python, you can look for it here. For instance, you need ImagePy and you can easily install this. And once you install it, you will be able to access it from your notebooks in ArcGIS Pro. Now, with that being said, Using the Geo Accessor I just talked about, I brought this in as a Python data frame. And using the, this method from scikit-learn, I'm finding some of these temporal outliers and cleaning this data up this way. And in the end, I basically have this data frame that is all cleaned up in Python. And the nice thing is, again, using the ESRI's um, 
ArcGIS API for Python, I can seamlessly bring this Pythonic data frame back in as a, as a Rango data frame. So this allows me to clean up some of my data using open source technologies. So after this is done, the next step is getting data. So as I said, bleaching depends on ocean conditions and I need data on these ocean conditions. So now we'll be working on this first step of this workflow, getting these NetCDF files. So I'll be talk, I'll be, I'll need to get 26 different variables for this analysis. So this is a pretty large scale analysis. I'm not going to read every one of them, but I will pause here if you're interested. Um, in short, I will need sea surface temperatures um, and their monthly, weekly, and annual summaries, summary statistics, like the mean standard deviation. I will need salinity, phosphate, silicate content. I will need irradiance, which is a measure of energy flux into the oceans. I will need light penetration, which is quite important. Dust levels, which impacts the light penetration. Aragonite saturation, which is a direct indicator for these coral reefs. And also cyclone activity and water currents that create perturbance in the water column. That is also quite important for this, uh, for this particular problem. So I need a lot of data. And as I said, I'll be consuming data that is created by NOAA and UCAR. I'll be using open source Python libraries in here um, just to bring it, bring this data set in. Um, some of these data, the CDF files are unstructured, meaning that they are not perfect grids, they are obtained at ship tracks. In order to wrangle this data easily, I'll be using the open source X array package. Um, so one, one shout out here is for the surface ocean carbon dioxide atlas. Uh, their data is quite useful for this analysis. And with this notebook, I directly download the NetCDF files that they serve that is publicly available for analysis. As you see, all these NetCDFs um, are reported uh, basically monthly. So for every year that we have analysis for, and in this case, it's 1997 to 2013, um, we need to download this data monthly one by one and using X-Array, I can merge these unstructured net CDFs into a single data structure. The reason I do that is in order for me to, in order for me to um, analyze this data set, it needs to be in one single data structure. And once this is done, let me talk about what I mean by analyzing this data structure. For instance, the salinity space-time cube that I observed from, uh, that I obtained from SOCAD. One thing I will need to do is for the entire year of 1998, remember some of the um, predictors are annual, weekly, or monthly summaries. I will be using, I'll be using the aggregate multidimensional raster tool to automatically create a yearly average of, of this data set that is reported monthly. And that's very easy to do with the aggregate multidimensional raster tool. As a matter of fact, this is how the aggregated data for 1998 looks like. You see that these are ship tracks and there are a lot of gaps. One thing I can fill these gaps in at the expense of introducing more uncertainty to this data source is using uh, interpolation. In this case, I'll be using empirical Bayesian Krieging as I know that there is strong non-stationarity in this data set. The average of these measurements change very strongly in space. Uh, and I would like to account for that using this uh, EBK methodology. What this does is it creates this continuous surface. At first, we know that this cannot be a valid estimate because we are filling in a lot of gaps uh, where we do not have data. So one rule we have in this analysis is if we have no ship tracks within 10 miles of an observation, we drop that here in our analysis. Now that we have gone through that, remember that we have 26 variables and we have to run these two functions for all 26 variables for all weeks, months, and years between 1997 and 2013. That's a lot of clicking. And I want to showcase how you can do this easily with the last Python notebook I will show, which is used for automation. Here, I'll be calling these functions that I just showed you, such as aggregate multidimensional raster and empirical Bayesian Krieging to loop through all variables, all years to automatically create all data sources that I need for different years. So with this automation story, I can, we visit all of the net CDFs that I downloaded in the previous notebook, and I can create uh, these analysis summaries. Now that I wrangled my data set, analyzed it in ArcGIS Pro, I would like to use a niche distribution model that is found in R. And that brings me to the last notebook that I will show today, which is an R notebook. And here on the top right, you will see the R logo. 
In particular, I'll be using the R ArcGIS Bridge, which is SG's R integration for ArcGIS Pro. ArcGIS Bridge gives you the ability to move data in and out seamlessly, do on-the-fly projections and subsetting, and also, as a new functionality, it allows you to call Pythonic geoprocessing tools that live in ArcGIS Pro from R so that you can create a sophisticated spatial analysis workflow in this R notebook. In addition, you will be able to consume remote data sources without the need to download them. And I will showcase some of this functionality. For those of you who use R, as you all know, the first step, just like in any programming language, is bringing all of the packages we need. And here the highlight being ArcGIS binding, which is the R ArcGIS bridge. I'll be using Gizmo and MaxLack, which are um, each one of which is a species distribution model, helper function, and the other one is a commonly used species distribution function, the max like. So the first step with using ArcGIS binding is using ArcCheck product to make sure that we have ArcGIS Pro on this machine and it has a license. One of the new functionalities is being able to import Python libraries. So we know that ArcPy is a Pythonic library, but using our reticulate integration in our uh, ArcGIS binding, we can directly bring in ArcPy as uh, into this R notebook to, to be called from this R notebook. The first step in my analysis is bringing in the coral bleaching data set that I wrangled previously. For this, I use the functions arc open and arc select. Once I do that, this data set is brought into R as a data frame, but this is in an ARC arc format. If you want to convert this to a commonly used function, um, spatial data representation, such as SP and SF, we have conversion functions such as data to SP and data to SF. And here, the data set that used to reside in ArcGIS Pro now resides in R as an R data frame. One thing I will need to do is limit my study area to shallow bathymetries where I would know that I will observe these particular species. I, I have a bathymetry polygon that I will bring into this R notebook. This is a geometry polygon, but again, using ArcOpen and ArcSelect, I can seamlessly bring it in. I'm going to be performing a geoprocessing task in loop. What I will do is I will take the shallow bathymetry polygon that is now in R as a spatial R data frame. I will take all the rasters that are created in the previous steps, and I will create a mask raster where I only have raster values in areas where I'm interested in for my analysis. So I will go through all of the years and all of the variables. And what I will do is I will call an arcpy function extract by mask to extract uh, the locations of this raster as the shallow bathymetry polygon. There are R functions that you can use in SF and raster packages. Um, this being a very large data set and extract by mask having um, being a very performant geoprocessing tool, I chose to use our ArcPy integration in this loop to create this, uh, to create this extraction. One last piece of data set that I wasn't able to get in the previous analysis is aragonite. This is a very important indicator for corals. And aragonite, I know, is a living atlas layer. This is an authoritative data layer that is created by um, that is created, created by multiple organizations. In this case, Marine Conservation Institute. So this data is already curated. And when I look at this web page, uh, sorry, this REST API, I can see in this web page that um, how this data set, this raster is distributed. With the new improvement to ArcGIS Bridge, you can directly read in this data set from this image server by just making a call to the REST API that serves this data set. You can use arc open on this URL and it'll automatically bring in this remote data source into R as an R data frame. So the last step that I will do now that I have all my rasters ready and wrangled is just create a raster stack, which is a stack of rasters combined in one data set in R, which is useful for, which is commonly used for species distribution model functions. So here I'm visualizing all of the rasters that I created for the year 1998. Well, I'm only visualizing um, the first 10 of them, but there are much, many more of those. And as you see in the end, Aragonite, which was this image service, now read into R and resides as an R data frame. I'll be fitting in a max-like function, a max-like distribution model to explain how different are the locations of severe bleaching with respect to everywhere else in the oceans. And this is a presence-only model. After fitting this and seeing that the probabilities of bleaching that this model produces, I see that the model was able to reduce entropy somewhat because we see that the model produces a lot of no bleaching and bleaching events so that there aren't a lot of um, fuzzy probabilities in the middle. 
I can export this data set using the arc write function so that I can further analyze this in ArcGIS Pro. You can write feature classes, rasters, any spatial data that we support in ArcGIS Pro. But in this case, I will keep this in R. And what I would like to do is I would like to compare forecasts of max light spatially to forecasts to observations that NOAA serves. So NOAA has this very interesting feature service where, and this is a live service. Um, so you see today, um, they report some, some conditions of the oceans and then they show whether or not there are bleaching events. In this R notebook, I will read this live data and I will compare it against my analysis results using yet another new function of R bridge, which is leaflet integration. In these R notebooks, now we have the ability to integrate, um, integrate these data sources. Here in, in these dots, in these circles, you see the predictions made by the model. And sorry, the, the dots are the NOAA's observations coming from this feature service. And the raster are the bleaching severities um, described by the model I just fit. And in this way, I can compare my model, the bleaching severity. These are low severities observed and a very low probability of observing severity. So there is some, um, there is some agreement with the model and the data here. So with this being said, um, as you see, you can use the ArcGIS, um, ArcGIS to do open analysis, bringing in many different data sources and utilizing different programming languages. Back to you, Lorraine. Um, we hope you've enjoyed um, this session today where you got to see an open and extensible platform for repeatable scientific analysis and the ability to work with Python and R and notebooks and be able to share your results and analyses with fellow scientists so that um, you can keep the open collaboration and working with open um, data sources and libraries. Over to you, Barbary. Thanks again to Lorraine, Adam, Oren, and Hong for sharing their expertise. Uh, special shout out to Amber and Noel for their support as well. We hope you have a wonderful day and tell a friend about Esri and Directions Magazine.